Hello and welcome to SIPS Level 2 Certificate in Procurement, Supply and Operations. This is Module 1 introducing Procurement and Supply and it's Learning Outcome 6, which is to know the importance of ethics and responsible procurement in organisations and supply chains. So I'm going to start with the SIPS Code of Conduct, which defines behaviours and actions that SIPS members must commit to maintain as long as they're members of SIPS. Members are expected to encourage their organisation to adopt an ethical purchasing policy based on the principles of this code and to raise any matters of concern relating to business ethics at the appropriate level. The SIPS Code of Conduct has five key principles. Integrity, professionalism, high standards, optimal use of resources, and compliance with legal and other obligations. All procurement professionals should be familiar with, understand and apply the SIPS Code of Conduct to ensure their work meets with the, co the code's guidelines. Now, organisations' codes of ethics usually cover human rights, the environment, bribery, fair trade, and dealing with conflicts of interest. Within procurement, conflicts of interest could present themselves, including being influenced by receiving gifts from a supplier or a potential supplier, being related to or close friends with a supplier, or receiving financial benefit for generating orders for a supplier. All potential or suspected conflicts of interest should be disclosed so appropriate action can be taken. And buyers should assess suppliers' ethical conduct when evaluating them to ensure they conform to your buying organisation's code of ethics. So let's have a look at some scenarios and decide if they could indicate a breach of ethics. As a thank you for your custom, a supplier sends a large box of chocolates and six bottles of wine to your, to your organisation. Would this be different if the gift were 10 tickets to a music concert or an offer of hospitality taking the procurement team out for lunch or dinner? What about a supplier that's using recycled packaging but they don't have a commitment to reduce their carbon footprint? or a supplier that sources 10% of their supplies from fair trade. A supplier has employees working 12 hours a day in order to meet deadlines during busy periods. Or a supplier's ethical code would match the organisation's ethics exactly, even down to the wording. Explore whether they have been supplied with the document and copied it and further investigation should be required to discover if they actually follow them. What are some of the negative impacts that could result from contracting with a supplier that doesn't meet your organisation's ethical codes? Reputational damage, negative media coverage, loss of staff or loss of custom. Now, organisations' corporate social responsibility policy outlines the policies that an organisation wishes to follow. So we'll have the economic, economic responsibilities to be profitable, the foundations of all which others' levels rest. The legal obligations, so obey the law. Law is society's codification of rights and wrongs. Play by the rules of the game. Ethical responsibilities is just about being ethical. The obligations to do what's right, just and fair and avoid harm. And philanthropic aims is about being a good corporate citizen, contributing resources to the community and improving quality of life. Now, most of the strands are responsibilities that an organisation can determine for themselves. However, the legal policies are obligations. The organisation can determ can't determine them for themselves. They are set by bodies that are outside of an organisation, like the country's law 
or the professional bodies. Now these CSR policies do not just affect the organisation you work for, they outline the way that the organisation wishes to impact on the world and as such all organisations that your organisation works with need to adhere to the same policies. So when should a buyer review the supplier's corporate social responsibility policies? Prior to contracting but also regularly throughout the contract to ensure they remain in line. And whenever the buying organisation's policies are updated, you need to check the suppliers meet your updated policies and give them time to make the changes. What do you need to check in relation to CSR policies? Check documents to see if suppliers' policies meet the buying organisation standards and visit the supplier to see if policies are followed in practice. Organisations often have policies and procedures to ensure uniformity in the way things are done and to promote transparency and fairness. Internal policies and procedures should relate to creating, sending and evaluating quotes and tenders. The evaluation of suppliers. Supplier relationship management. Contract management and quality. External policies and procedures that are used within procurement include professional standards such as SIPs or industry specific standards such as ISO that promote quality in both manufacturing and service organisations. It's good practice to be aware of any policies and procedures in the organisation you work for that relate to any product or service being sourced. So what's the difference between a policy and a procedure? What would happen if we didn't have policies and procedures? So why do we need policies and procedures? Have a think about that. Corporate governance, the procedures and policies by which an organisation is controlled. It's a framework that's created around the organisation's values and objectives. Corporate governance documentation includes an organisation's code of ethics and their code of conduct. It aims to direct by providing guidance for and controlling the actions of its employees and its stakeholders and the board of directors and managers. The policies contain the roles and expectations of people within the organisation to ensure that people don't take advantage of the organisation in an unfair way, which could result in a personal or professional gain. Let's have a look at the diagram. How do all of these elements relate to each other? And please make sure you check your understanding of each of those elements. And finally, exploitive labour in supply chains. So bonded and exploitive labour are forms of modern day slavery. Bonded labour is where an individual or family member becomes indebted to an organisation and has to work to pay off that debt. In many cases, the debt is never cleared and the individual or their offspring remains in a cycle of working for nothing indefinitely. It's most common in brick making, cotton manufacturing, agriculture, fishing and domestic work. Exploitive labour is where employers use their employees to their own advantage and treat them unfairly. This could be paying people no wages or an unacceptable amount, forcing people to work in unpleasant conditions and trafficking people to work in foreign countries for little or no money or using child labour. It's most common in agriculture, construction, manufacturing and the sex industry. It's the responsibility of the procurement function to conduct due diligence to make sure bonded and exploitive labour is not happening anywhere in the supply chain. How can you be sure that bonded and exploitive labour are not in your supply chain? Thanks again for watching.